In Romans, we left off in Romans chapter 8, nine months ago. Does anybody remember the verse that we left off in Romans chapter 8? That would be quite impressive. We left off technically on verse 28, but we're going to back up and I'm going to redo a teaching here from verse 18. 18. Um, the Bible in the book of Romans uh, has taught us anthropology greater than any other book in theology. Anthropology is the study of man. Theology, the study of God. It is the crown jewel of the gospel of all of the Bible is the book of Romans. And um, it could be said and has been said, I didn't say it, that uh, the book of Romans, the crown jewel of the gospel, but Romans chapter 8 is the crown jewel of the gospel as it relates to believers. It's this incredible chapter that we were able to study the first 15 verses. Martin Luther praised Romans. He said it is the chief part of the New Testament and the perfect gospel. It's the absolute epitome of the gospel. Luther's successor, Philip Melikin, called Romans the, also the absolute epitome of Christian doctrine. Uh, John Calvin said the book of Romans, when anybody understands this epistle, he has passaged or he has passed open to him the understanding of all scripture. So that's how important this book is. It is this apologia, that word apologetic where we get apologetics, uh, um, that word that's found when the uh, apostle Peter would say that we need to be ready to give a defense for the hope that we have. So the defense apologia. It's not that we're apologizing, but we're giving a defense. There is no greater defense um, ever written than the book of Romans. Um, another person said, I'm, I'm trying to get his exact words. Samuel Coleridge, English poet and literary critic, said Paul's letter to the Romans is the most profound literary work in existence. And even non-believers believe the book of Romans is one of the greatest literary works in the world. Because of many reasons, and I'm going to do an overview for a few minutes, the 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 argument that it gives, not just against um, the Jews' religion, Judaism, which it does, but against all religions that have ever existed except for the religion of Christianity, which is all about the person of Jesus Christ. He goes through it over and over. He would mention, especially in chapter 8 here at the beginning, about the law and the law and the law and the law. And and the word law is mentioned, I'm forgetting, we study it when we study chapter one, uh, a couple hundred times in the book of Romans. Now, it's not always mentioned in the same usage. Sometimes when it mentions the word law, it mentions um, the law of Moses. Other times when it says the word law, it's talking about that moral consciousness, uh, for lack of better words, that spirit within us that knows right from wrong. Now, it does not know right from wrong exhaustively, all of it, because true righteousness is a person and we can't know Christ without biblical revelation uh, predominantly. There are Muslims and other people around the world who have and are having visions of Christ appearing to them, which I believe are, are true. But in Romans 1, it teaches us some very interesting things. Now, the Apostle Paul, in that profound, famous verse, this says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it's the power unto salvation 
for the Jew first and then for the Gentile. And so he goes on talking about how debased mankind has become. That word debased, brought down low. Um, And it would say that through creation itself, especially what is in them, in us, in humanity. Now it would go on, to, it, it, it would talk about all of creation, the universe, the stars, and all creation means everything, angels and all of creation. And then it would narrow its focus from all of creation Um, that uh, through that, there's evidence that there is a God, that he is all-powerful, this creator. It narrows down especially what's in them, inside of us. Um, Some theologians call it the God consciousness. It's that moral compass, that moral consciousness that unbelievers have. All human beings, those who are not born again, those who are not regenerate, those who do not have salvation. And they have a moral consciousness. Why? Because they're created in the image of God. We can know things about God, Romans 1 teaches us. We know things about God that um, we intuitively know. Intuitively means we have not been taught it would, Preston Media Team, would you guys just turn this off so it can stop flashing, please? Sorry, guys, I'm easily distracted. I know none of you are. Let's just turn it off. And so this intuitive knowledge, it's no one's told us. We know by what's created, especially what's in us, and that's why it's intuitive. It's inside of us. And that is that There is a God, because he created all things. This is what Romans 1 teaches, that he's all-powerful, because you have to be all-powerful to create all things, and that he is more than one. Our best translation says a Godhead, and we got into that in depth when we went through that. I can't go through it again. But all that to say, as, we, as Paul led us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit through seven chapters of Romans, it speaks of man's complete inadequacy, lack of strength and ability to save himself. It's very important. The greatest argument ever given on this is the book of Romans. Man cannot save himself. And, and we could go into lectures regarding many of the different world religions, but understand that all world religions and ideologies, including what we'll be talking about on Friday and Saturday with the creation conference, debunking evolution, is they are ascending. They are reaching up. They proclaim power. That's, that's all world religions. Islam, we can reach up and save ourselves by our own good works. We can reach up in Hinduism, and that's the whole karma. Be good, be good, be good, so that you don't come back um, something that is a lower life form. It's an exaltation to higher life forms until you become a god. And, and so all world re- religions, other than Christianity, is reaching up to try to attain to heaven and paradise and Godhead. And Christianity, the only true religion, is God coming down to save us so that he can take us up in his own righteousness and his own strength. That is the biggest difference of it all, everybody. And Paul goes through seven chapters of this. And then in chapter seven, he comes to this description of Himself, as he is defined for seven chapters, comes to this description of himself that is completely sinful. He uses in chapter seven 47 pronouns, personal pronouns. I and me and me and I and I and me, oh wretched man that I am. 
The things that I don't want to do, I do. And the things I do want to do, I don't do. Who will save me from this body of sin and death? And then he gets into Christ Jesus there at the end. And then in chapter 8, in Christ Jesus, the the hope that we have. And it would mention that word law. I mentioned before that often it's used with the, the, the law of Moses. But then the other word used for law is the moral consciousness that we have, that God consciousness that even unbelievers have. They know right from wrong because they are created in the image of God. So listen. You get the question, what about that person who is in a tribe in Africa or South America and Asia who's never heard the name of Christ who's never seen a Bible, and they die, will God send them to hell? And the answer is yes. Because Romans 1 teaches us very clearly there they are without excuse because of what has been created in them. They are connected to God, not through salvation, don't hear me wrong, not through not the biblical term reconciliation, which talks about that relationship that we have through the righteousness that we have to be able to enter the Holy of Holies and all of that, but they are still connected to God in a way that when they violate their consciousness, guilt and shame and condemnation comes upon them and they also being created in the image of God, intuitively know because of the crimes they've committed, the intuition of man through being created in God's image would suggest factually that they should seek for a savior. Now I know we're, we're getting into some deep stuff and Um, all all of this controversy that we'll speak a little bit more about, not much, a little bit more about with hyper-Calvinism and all this. But the God consciousness knows when wrong is being done. And many of you know this to be true because when you were young, as a non-believer, you knew what you were doing wrong when you started sinning. And I was transparent enough some time ago to mention that I was exposed to, by an older brother, pornography at the age of nine. I was exposed to drugs at the age of 11. I knew they were wrong without anybody telling me. In fact, I never heard of pornography. And at nine years old, when I was given that magazine, something inside of me started screaming, this is wrong, don't look. And I ignored it. I violated the moral conscience within me which emanates from God's nature and being created in his image. And because of original sin, in that violation I was guilty, but also that guilt should have caused me to search for a savior who can save me from the crimes that are committed. Somebody who can pay the price, in other words. So what happens, guys, is General revelation should lead, and that's us, general revelation, to seek for a supernatural solution. And those who seek after God will find him. Those who ask, it will be given to them. Those who knock, the door will be open. God is limited to show himself to just the scripture, though he primarily reveals himself through scripture. And what I mean by that is back to those who do want to be purged from the sin and the condemnation and the guilt that their consciousness has demonstrated to them, God will reveal himself if they're a genuine seeker. And that's why Muslims are having visions around the world God's not limited. He can send, Jesus Christ can come appear before them. He can send angels. And we know that's true because he's done it in the past. We know of entire people groups that have no recorded missionaries or Bibles coming in that they, when you go in there, they have Bibles and they tell a story of angels coming in and sharing the gospel and giving them Bibles. 
So God's not limited. Though he primarily uses his people to share the gospel, that does, does not mean he's not limited in sharing the gospel. In the book of Revelation, there'll be angels flying around in the sky preaching the gospel. During that seven-year tribulation period. So all that to say there is a moral consciousness. Guys, don't, don't ignore it. Because here's the danger. When you ignore it, you'll be seared with a hot iron. You'll be calloused. To the point when I was 14, 15, 16, 17 years old, I absolutely had no consciousness anymore. It was completely seared. Sin was everything without remorse and without guilt. It's a very dangerous place to be in. It's an extremely dangerous place to be sinful with no moral compass or consciousness about your sin. And that can happen. So all of this leading up to Paul in verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So I think the last couple verses we'll save primarily for next week, but let's go through this. He begins, Where I do not, for I do not consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. There is a context here that is immensely important. Now, before I get to it, understand that, yes, God is comforting us in that general suffering that we all go through. We all go through general suffering. Many of us have suffered, some more than others, but all of us have suffered to a certain degree of loneliness and pain. Um, others of us, of us have suffered through broken families, the father was not there, maybe some of our fathers were abusive, drunks, um, maybe even some of our mothers abandoned us and we were orphaned, a lot of pain. Um, some of us have projected that as many as, and, and we don't know this, this is a made up statistic, this is just based on inf informed knowledge, that m maybe as many as 80% of the women in our church have been molested, this is a real issue. People go through pain. And yes, God is promising that one day these sufferings will end. That the pain we've gone through, both past, the present pain, any future pain, cannot be compared, are not worthy to be compared to the glory that we will have with Christ when we are in heaven. So that's good news. But there is a context here that we can't ignore. The context and the reason for that introduction, um, other than we've been on break for these months as 
At this particular time in my life, I'm in the States for four or five months of the year, and I hope over time I can come back to being full-time here in Kenya as, as that is my personal desire. But the context is Paul is speaking against any ideology, any religion, any worldview that would give men the ability to ascend to God with their own righteousness, with their own power, with their own strength. Um, he's spoken against this. We cannot ascend through the righteous works of man. We don't have righteous works. Our righteous works are as filthy rags. God is offended. We suggest that we can go to heaven without Jesus Christ. He will not allow it. He will not allow people in heaven without the blood of Jesus Christ covering their sins. So Paul has gone through this. And the present sufferings that the Christians in Rome and throughout the Christian world are going through is world religions, especially in this particular day, world ideas World views of different nations are persecuting the church, destroying them, killing them, ripping their children out from their mother's arms and killing them in front of them. And all they have to do, all they have to say is, I don't believe in Jesus Christ. I give adherence, I give allegiance to Caesar. I don't believe. That's all they got to do. And then their children can be spared. Their husbands, their wives, their brothers, their sisters. And the Apostle Paul is writing that, that, that first of all, ideologies, bad beliefs, world religions that are ascending, trying to ascend, God will bring them low, they have consequences. There's consequences to it. Violence. Think of all the violence of different religions. Think of the violence of Islam. Think of it. And, 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 and as one apologist once said, when somebody is killing in the name of Islam, they are properly working out their worldview. When somebody is killing in the name of Christ, they are improperly working out their worldview. We don't kill in the name of Christ because Christ never called us to kill. When you're killing in the name of, of, of Islam, you are following it accurately. And, and I don't care if that's controversial, that is simply the facts. And, and let me tell you something else. Muhammad himself, he was cast out as a weird person because of his different weird visions and beliefs. And the people who received him were Meccan Jews and brought in him and gave him a place to live and eat. And when he left, 20 years later, he came back. He was stronger then and he had garnished a, a following and the Jews rejected Islam and Muhammad killed all of them. All of them. So you can't tell me that Islam is not a violent religion when the founder of it was most violent of them all. And, and, and this is the point, guys. The sufferings that the world has gone through, especially the sufferings that the Romans are going through right now, or not right now, right then, as terrible as they are, cannot be compared. They're not even worthy to be compared with the glory that these people are gonna have in heaven. That's a wonderful promise. It's a wonderful thing. Even us, we, we're going through things. Many of you are suffering. Don't allow your pain to draw you away from God. We'll get that into that more next week when we talk about for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. 
Verse 19, for the earnest expectation of creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the Son of God. I was at the wedding yesterday and I shared once again that one day the church, the bride of Christ, will be revealed to the rest of the world. In fact, that specific day is at the end of the tribulation period when Jesus comes back, the battle of Armageddon is going to happen and then he's going to establish a thousand year millennial kingdom on earth. Do you know who's with him when he comes back? Anyone? The church. The church is with him. We get to return and witness the battle of Armageddon. And we're going to be worshiping Jesus Christ when he destroys the nations that come against him, which, by the way, is every nation except the nation of Israel. Every nation. And he'll destroy them. He's going to show the world who we are as the bride of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ. As a bridegroom reveals his bride when he lifts the veil, there will come a day that the veil is lifted and they get to see us. Now, I, I don't think it's just for the sake of recognition, but, but Jesus Christ essentially has made us wear robes of white, and he's showing us, and that's why we get that imagery at weddings that we do. That's why the women wear right. It's a sign of a white. It's a sign of purity and all those things. That's going to happen biblically. It's like, look at my pure bride. Look how she's been cleansed. And you, you talk about, you know, people want to be recognized in this world. Recognized. And the wrong people are getting recognized and the right people are not getting recognized. The right people is the church. You know the Bible would even say about the apostles and the prophets that the world was not worthy of them. You know it says that? The world is not worthy of them. In fact, the world would kill them. You remember when Stephen gave that amazing sermon in the book of Acts to the religious leaders. And he said, you are just like your fathers you murder the prophets and the people of God. It's an incredible moment. One of the best sermons of all time is Stephen's sermon, I believe right there in Acts chapter seven. Creation. It's what the Bible says. Creation is eagerly waiting for us to be revealed. Isn't that flattering? Now, don't let it puff you up. It, the reason we're pure and beautiful and righteous is because of Christ. And he takes pride in his ability to make us righteous. He has, he, well, I, that's probably the wrong thing, taking pride. He, he, he's excited about it. it. It's this amazing thing that's going to take place. And you don't want to be on the wrong side, I promise. You need to become the bride of Christ. In fact, all of you men, just go put a wedding dress on right now. No, don't. That would be weird. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into glorious liberty of the children of God. So creation is eagerly waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. And it's not just talking about the angels. They're waiting for us to be revealed. Essentially, the angels like, you have no idea who these people are. They have a king who is going to destroy you if you keep messing with them. But creation itself eagerly waits. That's all parts of creation. That's the animals, the angels, the universe, the rocks, the donkeys. Do you remember in Luke 19? You remember when they're worshiping Jesus Christ, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. The disciples are praising him as God. And the religious leaders say, tell your disciples to stop worshiping you. 
Only God's worthy of worship. She's like, yep, you're right. I'm God. But anyway, he says, listen, if, if, they're, if they're to be quiet, the rocks will cry out. And listen, if you don't think rocks can cry out, you don't know the power of God. Do you remember? Even donkeys can talk if God wants them to talk. Remember Balaam? Donkey starts, guys, this guy is insane. You will become completely darkened in your mind and insane if you're not following Jesus Christ. He begins to talk to the donkey. Why are you hitting me? Because you're a bad donkey. It's, if a donkey says something to me, I'm not gonna, maybe I will. Maybe you'll find me talking to donkeys out in the street because I've gone crazy. He just starts talking to him. He didn't say, hey, why are you talking? No. He just starts talking. Why? Because he's a madman. He's crazy. And you will become a mad person and crazy, darkened in your mind if you are not enlightened by the word of God. We're just, we're, uh, we don't want to find you out on the road talking to donkeys and cows. You need to have the word of God in your life. So ever since this time, creation, all of creation, the earth, there are even scientists who said that all thorns, you guys, we know what thorns are very well. All thorns are flowers. You ever heard this? All thorns are flowers, but they've died. They've become dormant, in other words. And the reason this happened is because um, many scientists along with Bible scholars that, bam, when, when man fell in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, there was a shock wave that went throughout creation, destroying parts of the earth. And it's, isn't it somewhat ironic that th there is scientific evidence that all thorns are flowers. It happened during the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and the th very thing that is strapped across the head of Jesus Christ to maximize pain are thorns that should have been flowers because Adam and Eve disobeyed him. And then one day, creation is going to open up again and all these thorns are gonna become flowers again and we're gonna see a world that is, the well, we're gonna get a new heaven and earth, but there's gonna be no thorns in it. No thistles, no dust that we're breathing in our lungs. We live in a fallen world. This is evidence, guys. That we live in a fallen world. And creation is eagerly waiting because creation itself was delivered into bondage. The corruption and bondage, but they're waiting. For we know that they were, um, that creation was delivered into bondage, into futility, not willingly. So here's the idea. Here's what happened. God creates the heavens and the earth. He puts Adam in the garden. It's perfect. It's beautiful. It, it's without blemish, including creation. But he subjected it to futility. What does, what does that mean? God put in the garden the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and then allowed the serpent, that great snake of old Lucifer, to slither his way to tempt Adam and Eve. He subjected creation. God subjected creation to the possibility of a fall. Now, he, not willingly means he subjected it, but he was not willing that it did fall. In other words, this hyper-Calvinism, and by the way, not all Reformed people are hyper-Calvinists. If you know what I'm talking about, just stay with that, because I'm not trying to diss, all, diss this, this movement. But the, the hyper-Calvinist view is God actually wanted Adam and Eve to fall, and he's the one who caused them to do it. I reject that. I think it is a lie from you know where. No, he, he subjected it to futility. He gave the possibility of a fall, but he didn't want them to sin against him. But he subjected it in hope. In other words, if they did fall, 
Not that he was willing that they did, because he's not willing that any should perish. He had a plan. And that hope and that plan was Jesus Christ. Now, some of you may ask, why? Why did God put the garden, uh, in the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and why did he let Satan to come in to tempt Adam and Eve? Guys, it is a simple answer. It's very simple. He had to give an alternative to them loving him. Because love, if it's not a choice, is not love at all. Love is a choice. And God is not going to force us to love him. That is a ridiculous notion. Can you imagine, ladies? You have a whole world of men, right? And most of you are single. But you can imagine even married women. And you, you got a guy who comes up to you and he says, hey, will you marry me? And you do not like this guy. He repulses you and you're like, ew, gross. I will not marry you. And then all of a sudden, a nuclear bombs go off and there's only two survivors in the whole world. It's you. And guess who else? That guy that you said no to. And he comes up a second time and he says, hey, Will you marry me? He's like, yeah, of course. <laughs> Do you really think he's going, to, the, 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 he's going to believe that if you had other choices, you would marry? No, you already told him no. When you have no choice, it's not love. It's the only choice you got. And God, knowing everything, knows that. So he gave Adam and Eve a choice. And he warned them. Ladies, you will not appreciate along that same illustration if you're walking down the street and a van pulls up, grabs you, throws you in the van, ties you up, and the guy says, I just want you to know, you will be my wife. It doesn't work that way. So God puts the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He allows them to be tempted. If they would resist Satan, he would have fled from them. But they didn't. So he subjected it to futility, emptiness, pain, not willingly that they would walk in that, but then he had hope because he planned Christ to come for them. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs until now. Not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption and the redemption of our body, for we were saved in this hope. But what is hope if it is seen? Hope that is seen is not hope, for why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait with it with perseverance. And we're going to stop there, but listen. Paul is doing this amazing thing. He's just, he, he, he's utterly brilliant. And of course, I know the Holy Spirit's upon him, but he's doing this amazing thing. He's bringing in this context of suffering. We're suffering. Our, our children are being killed. They're going hungry. There's famines. We're suffering because we're Christians. He says, I know. I, I, I know that. They're like, is this real? Is this, is this Christianity real? Is what we're believing in real? And Paul's like, listen, the down payment's the Holy Spirit. So two things. The down, number one, the down payment is the Holy Spirit. Guys, do you remember when you seared your consciousness when you were young, you knew you were doing wrong, and you seared your consciousness, and you didn't desire God at all? When I was 14, 15, 16, 17 years old, I hated church, hated it. In fact, when I was 12 and 13, my mom was still forcing me to go to church. As many nerdy pastors said, I had a drug problem. My mom drugged me to church. That was a little late, but you got it, okay. And you guys know I was such a terrible, terrible person that the church that my mom drugged me to, I would take the pastor's son, we would sneak around the side of the building and smoke bangy. 
we would come back in the church really stoned and we would spray Windex over ourselves so our parents didn't smell us. I don't know how they didn't smell us. Windex does not cover Bengi. Just some free advice. You need like some cologne or change your clothes entirely. It'll be better. You didn't know you were going to get that advice from your pastor. It's better not to smoke it at all, people. (laughs) You know, I got to preach at that same church, and the pastor was sitting in the front row. He let me preach, and I told the whole church, I used to smoke weed with your son right over there by that tree. But God saved me, and I no longer smoke bangy. The church was so happy. (laughs) The point is, guys, we have a down payment of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit came into my life, all of a sudden, I want to go to church. What is happening? I want to read my Bible. I want to know Jesus Christ. I want to stop the drugs. I want to stop the drunkenness. Everything changed. What happened? The Holy Spirit came. You guys know what I'm talking about. Your whole life, you don't even think about the things of God. All of a sudden, you think about the things of God. So... They're asking Paul and they're saying, Paul, what hope do we have? Is this real where our children are being slaughtered? There's a famine in Jerusalem. The church is suffering. Paul says, the Holy Spirit's in you. And why, and this is the second thing, why do you still hope in what you can see? There's no hope in what you can see. So based on this logic, on this defense, Paul's saying, show me one thing that you can see that you're to put your hope in. Oh, I got to get a career. Let me make a lot of money so that I can buy a house and a car and we can be comfortable. Guys, or maybe even not buy a house. You're like, oh, we finally have enough money to rent an apartment that is two bedroom or three bedroom so we can fit our family. And, and you're like, there's false hope that comes in you, right? False hope. And you, and you go in to the apartment. You're like, yes, we got the apartment. And then you turn the faucet on. And then Elder Waz has turned the water off because of the agricultural show. And you have no water for your family. And then you go turn the power on. And... There's no power for a few hours. And then the power comes on and the light bulbs don't work in your new apartment. There's no hope in what you can see. There's not even hope for you in your husband or your wife or your children. What are you going to... You know, guys, when you're young with your wife or wives, they like... By the way, women like strong men, just in case you guys didn't know. Okay, just this is not like biblical advice, but I might advise you to do some push-ups or something. <laughs> Having a little meat on your bones is is nice, right, ladies? Yes, so we got it. We got three yeses. I won't show who because no. Anyways, we're strong when we're young, aren't we? I remember, you know, it's this weird thing on a honeymoon, you're supposed to grab your wife and carry her through the doorway. Is that a custom here in Kenya? No? She had too much ugali? No? <laughs> don't, don't kill me, I'm joking. I don't know, it's this custom. You, you guys, Americans, you heard this, you can't carry your wife. Man, my wife is light. I can carry that lady throw on my back. You know, it's still to this day, she, lo- she, she thinks it's this fun game where I'll pick her up and carry her up the stairs. She wants to jump on. Did you guys know that my wife still asks for piggyback rides? <laughs> she wants to feel how strong I am when I'm carrying up the stair like a proud husband. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to tell you guys something. She can't rely on that because I'm not going to be able to carry up the stairs when I'm 90 years old. There's no hope in it. As the worship team comes up, let me tell you something, guys. The word of God is saying to you this morning, why are you still putting your hope in what you can see? Why? Is there not enough evidence 
around the world for all people to say there's no hope in what we can see. This world is dying. Our families are dying. We're deteriorating. There's thorns and thistles. There's no hope. Creation eagerly waits. And so does the Christian. Because he who has hope in what he does not see, he has perseverance. He is going to, that's what the Bible says, he's going to persevere. He's going to walk strong. She's going to walk strong. She says, I know our bodies are dying. I know Eldawa shut off the water. And I know me and my husband are getting old. But we have hope in Jesus Christ that when we do die, that person that we cannot see gave us the down payment of the Holy Spirit and now we will be with him face to face. That is the hope we have and that is what keeps us going on, amen? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the hope that we have. And I pray... Lord, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit right now. As your heads are bowed, I want to give that offer. Anybody who's not born again, anybody who's not walking with the Lord, you're backslidden. And you've been trusting in the things that you can see. It's become an idol. I want to pray for you. Anybody who wants to receive Jesus Christ or return back from your backslidings, raise your hand right now so that I can pray for you. Just raise your hand right where you sit and I'm going to pray for you right now. You've been trusting in the wrong things. Yes, I see people raising their hand. Anybody else? Keep your hands up as I pray for you, Lord. I pray for each person who's raised their hand right now. Maybe they're backslidden. Maybe they've not been born again ever, Lord. But I pray that you'd pour out your Holy Spirit upon them. Please help them, Lord. Please help them with the down payment of the Holy Spirit within them to put their hope in the things they cannot see. That is Jesus Christ, our Lord. And save them, Lord. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Keep your hands raised, guys. Real up tall, guys. Let's see them over here and over here. God bless you. Thank you. You can put your hands down. If you raise your hand, please go to the Connect station. There's people there even with Connect t-shirts or yellow shirts on. And fit out the new believer uh, form. And we'll call you this week. We'll give you a Bible. Lord, we also pray for the offering now, the great privilege we have as Christians to believe in the gospel so much that we're willing to financially invest in it and also to love you so much that we give in faith. And I pray you would receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. As the ushers and deacons come forward, would you please stand on your feet as we worship God together. May God bless you.